So I salute each and every one this afternoon in the honorable and the blessing words of grace, mercy, and peace. May they be multiplied unto you. We welcome you to the voice. And for those who may not know, some that may be new joining, or those that have been uh, with this movement of the Lord for a period of time, I always remind each and every one, what is the voice? Well, the voice is something that the Lord God has called me to charter to teach to everyone why you believe what you believe and why you do what you do. So often we as believers, we live a life of following the Bible to the best of our ability, or we follow other people that follow the Bible and we just kind of jump on the bandwagon and find ourselves doing what we see other people doing. But at some point in time, at the end of the day, we'll find ourselves asking the question, why am I doing that? Uh, or, or we'll find ourselves, why do they do that, and why am I copying that? I, I, I know this, this probably is like an elephant in a room that a lot of people don't address, but it's the reality of the matter. In this dispensation, in this period, it is so important to an individual to know where they are and where they're going versus just existing. So in that, in the things that we do, in the direction that we're going, we need to know why we're going in that direction and why we believe that direction is where we should go. And I strongly believe using that as a platform of understanding, this is something that's significant with us as the believers. Because even though we can look at the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the reality of the matter is the Bible is meant to be our guideline, or some people say uh, our, our book of information that is our last instructions here to get us there in eternity. But the fact of the matter, the book is meant to shape your character to get you where you need to be. Amen. So in that, on today, I, I continue, this is part eight, and it's probably the concluding part on this specific subject that we've been on, uh, the purpose in being divinely perfect. The purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, in being divinely perfect. And what the Lord has allowed over the duration of the previous seven sessions that we've had We've looked at different aspects of perfect in regards to who needs to be perfect, when do we need to be perfect, why do we need to be perfect, how do we need to be perfect, what is being perfect, uh, uh, amen. And, and today, we, we will be looking primarily at where in our lives or within ourselves are we perfect. Or are we perfected? Amen. Now, for those who may be joining for the, for the first time, who may have not even been able to touch base with any of the previous teachings, let me kind of spool you up. When we talk about being perfect, understand we are not talking according to what man has defined as perfect. Because, unfortunately, it's been an indictment against the kingdom of the Lord God for us to adopt what man says as our author, founder, and finisher of our faith, of our belief system. Many in the body of Christ and many that have either fallen away from the body of Christ or outside of the body of Christ say, you, you all do things that seem to be impossible. You're, you're doing something that, that doesn't make any, as we say, rhyme or reason. And so in that, could it be it doesn't make rhyme or reason because a lot of things that people outside the body of Christ or have fallen away from the body of Christ have based the rhyme and reason on what man has defined things to be. Mm -hmm. Are, are y'all thinking about what I'm, what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so there's some things that we know definitely are impossible for man. But according to Philippians, all things are possible in Christ Jesus. All things are possible. But the, th but the thing is, we have to understand all things or all sayings or all word Amen. is possible in Christ Jesus based on his standard, his definition, 
his intent or his purpose. So, yes, much is impossible according to man's interpretation. But all things are possible according to the Lord God's interpretation. And we, according to scripture, it says kings searcheth the thing out. So that means if I have a king in me, mm-hmm. now, now I, I ain't talking about a king of England. I'm talking about divine kingship. And if I have divine authority in me, then it would behoove me to do my homework to know what is the depth of my authority in divine places. Shame on me if I do not take the time and the effort to find out and foundationalize what I have authority in. Hope I'm helping somebody today. So in that, we're going to look at this thing once again about being perfect, divinely perfect. When we look at that word perfect, we we have touched many different aspects of it in both the Old and the New Testament. And as we, we've looked at it, we've looked at it from the perspective of the word uh, teleos, which means to be complete, to be made whole, to be finished. We've looked at it from the aspect of the word tainim, uh, which means unimpaired, undefiled, upright, having moral integrity. We've looked at perspectives of the word perfect to mean mature, to to be of age. We've looked at it in the the context of being repaired, uh, uh, having divine surgery to be fixed. We've looked at it in the context of being equipped especially when many people look at the giftings of the church in Ephesians chapter 4, for the perfecting of the saints, meaning the equipping of the saints. So, So in that, as we have looked at all these different spectrums of what it means to be perfect according to the Lord God, we, we come to the conclusion that it has nothing to do with what Webster's Dictionary has told us, to be without fault, to, to be without error, to be without defect. So now that should even bring hope to the believer that's under the sound of my voice because now you're saying, okay, this, this is something possible because now that I've got the Lord God's perspective on perfect versus man's perspective, I can quit beating myself up and saying, I'm not worthy. I'm not eligible. I can never achieve that. I'm already damned or I am going to continue to live a life of hell versus being in a heavenly place. So in saying all of that, it brings me today to the sixth element of this subject. And the sixth element of this subject is once again, answering the question, where? Meaning, where within myself or within my life do I become divinely perfect? Now, in that, should I say this becomes something that allows itself to be the marker for us as individuals to say, Lord God, I'm being perfected because I can see it happening in these areas within myself. See, there's a lot of things that we do as believers. And as I said here earlier, without you knowing why you believe what you believe and why you do what you do, have you ever asked yourself, what is the measuring stick that you utilize to determine what you're doing in him is right? Have you ever considered what is the measuring stick or gauge for you to say that something of the Lord God is working in your life for you to know you're in the Lord God? I ask that because hopefully this answers the question today 
that if we are now shaping our mind about being perfect in the Lord God, then where am I looking to be perfect in my life while I'm on this journey being led by his Holy Spirit to walk out the whole process of being perfected? Amen? So, let me give you the first scripture that will hopefully help you out this afternoon. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Now I want to tell you up front, my focus is verse 61. But I need to give you a little bit of meat prior to that in which I'm going to start at verse 56 to read through verse 62. Amen. So if somebody wants to star verse 61, that's where I believe the power comes with this particular subject as to the first thing you need to say as to where perfection is working in you. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 56, it says, and I'm reading to you all from the King James Version. It says, blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of all his good promise. Listen to what it's saying. Blessed be the Lord, meaning beneficial is the Lord. Because nothing that he says as a word has the potential to fail, not be successful, uh, uh, not come through, not manifest. Amen. Then it says, there hath not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant, or by the direction, the righteous direction that his servant has given Listen, listen to what it says. When you are under the sound of a righteous servant that's giving you the right direction in the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord doesn't fail. Isn't it a strange thing that it may fail for some people because who's giving them the direction ain't using the direction the way that the Lord God wants it. Now, I ain't trying to preach, but I'm, I'm trying to give you some context here. I, 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 I first got to say, if there's somebody that's going to give me something, they've got to be recognized as a servant of the Lord for me to know that they've given me the right word from the Lord. All right. Y'all with me? All right. Then it says, verse 57, the Lord our God be with us. As he was with our fathers, let him not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts unto him to walk in all his ways, keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commandeth our fathers. Now, let if I may, let me stop right there because I want to make sure everybody under the sound of my voice understand what was just said. He says that we incline our hearts, meaning our inner man, our, our spirit man, to walk with him. But walking with him is one, first, keeping or exercising and guarding what he says to you. Commands, remember, are something verbally said. Laws are what's verbally said and written down in order for you to practice, especially if you wasn't present to be spoken to. Are y'all hearing me? So, to keep his commandments, keep his statutes, and if I can put that in layman's terms, statutes means prescription. The word of the Lord is a prescription or a medication that you are supposed to take to put you in good health. So 
He speaks to you. He gives you divine medication. Then it says his judgments, which means what's separating you or consecrating you. Because if he speaks to you and he's giving you a prescription, the prescription is meant to remove something that ain't supposed to be in you. That means something has to be separated in order for you to be in a place that you're dedicated to the righteousness of him. Now, he says he did this to all of your fathers. Everybody that has had an impact in shaping who you are. Are, are y'all with me? Still moving on. And he says, and let these my words wherewith have made supplication before the Lord. Be nigh unto the Lord. Be close unto the Lord, our God, day and night that he maintain the cause of his servant. Listen, listen. Based on this, this passage, it's saying, if you do all of these things, he will continue to talk to the servant. Whoever you're trusting as being a servant of the Lord, the Lord God says, if the people will be led by them. What does leading mean other than to influence? If the people can be influenced by somebody who represents the Lord, then what happens is the Lord says, I can trust them to continue to lead you. And I will continue to talk to them and give them instructions and medication for you as long as you're doing what they're saying as the instruction by me. The verse says that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people, Israel, at all times, as the matter shall require. That all the people of the earth may know or may understand that the Lord is God mm -hmm. and that there is none else. Yes. So what it's saying is this brings understanding. Now we're, we're getting down, we're getting down to this thing of where divine perfection is, but I need to set the standard from this passage so you can understand what's going on. Now, verse 61, key verse, let your heart therefore be perfect with the Lord, our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments as at this day. And then it says in 62, and the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. Key word, sacrifices. Okay, so in this, what we can extrapolate from the passage, based on the precursors, that an individual is supposed to do. Note, as we said here before, listen to commandments, keep the statutes, keep the way. Based on these things that are being said in verse 58, watch this. He says, where it is in you that perfection occurs is in your heart. Mm -hmm. See, that, that, that tells us that the medication and the conversation with the Lord is not external. It's meant to be internal. The more I listen to what he's saying as my commands and the more I apply his word as a medication with what he's saying to me, the more it does a work in and for and through my heart. Now, I don't want anybody to think that we're talking about your physical heart. What I'm talking about is your inner man. 
What I'm talking about is your spirit man. What I'm talking about is that this strikes right to the core of the soul. And when it strikes to the soul, when I can feel the beat of my heart, i.e. my soul, change from the lifestyle that it's been not hearing God to a lifestyle that now can hear God, know the pulse of God, uh, 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 begin to live a daily regiment of the prescription of the word of the Lord. Now I begin to see where perfection is working. See, some people are thinking that I need to be perfect on my external. But the thing is, there's nothing that I can do to make myself look perfect on the outside. The core of perfection, according to the word of the Lord, is not a prescription for your outside. It is a prescription that's meant for your inside. See, if I don't, if I don't have my heart together, then watch this. The, the, the rest of my key organs on the inside will begin to malfunction. Are y'all, are y'all hearing me? So if that be the case in the natural, it's the same parallel in the spiritual. I've got to have my heart regulated by the regulator. And the commandments and the statutes regulate the rhythm of my heart. Now, can I, can I give you all a sidebar about this thing about the heart? I don't know if, if many in the body of Christ have ever asked yourself, even in the Old Testament, why the heart was always referenced. For those who don't know, what's very interesting is under Hebraic culture, it was known or understood that any decision you made based on a question that was asked you, it causes your heart to beat at a different rhythm just to answer the question. Why do you, why do you, why do you think even in government systems, when they do a lie detector test, they hook you up to see what changes the pattern of your heart rate to answer the question? See, when you're telling the truth, you're still cool, calm, and collected. It's when you tell a lie that causes your heart to increase and get out of rhythm just to create an answer. So now, now, now that we know that, now that we know that, it should really resonate with each and every one of us the depth of what this means spiritually that my perfecting is meant to work with my heart or my spiritual inner man. Because, see, watch this. The more that I live according to his commandments and his word or his statutes, the less I put my heart at risk of being in cardiac arrest. Mm -hmm. Because if I live according to his truth, I can't live to a lie. Right. And if a lie is what puts me at risk, mm -hmm. then it's not in my best interest to be a liar. Even Jesus talks about the adversary was a liar. Uh -huh. oh, okay. Uh, I, I hope somebody's yeah. learning something. hope you're getting something out of this. So, so now that tells me then, based here on 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 61, let your heart. And see, something else. It, the, the, the verse says let, meaning don't be in resistance. You have to posture yourself to allow 
your heart or inner man to be perfect. Amen. Now, the word perfect in this verse is shalem, which means to be complete. All right. Made ready and made to be at peace or made to be in order. So it starts with my inner man being in order. Mm -hmm. And once again, that's being done by his statutes and his commandments. Let me give you another passage, show you something else. Turn with me to the book of Psalms. In the book of Psalms, chapter 19. In Psalms, chapter 19, here's something else for you to chew on. Verses 7 through 9, the scripture says, The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. Okay. Stop right there. The law of the Lord is perfect. It is whole. It is complete. It is a healer. It is an establisher. But then it says the law converts the soul. For those who don't know what we're talking about with converting, it's the Hebrew word shub, which is the same word for repentance. So the law of the Lord causes an individual, if we pick it back off of what I just said in 1 Kings chapter 8, if we piggyback off of his precepts, his commandments, his statutes, his way, then watch this, as a segue, what happens is those things of the Lord God are what are necessary to cause you to repent. Now, for those who don't know when we say repent according to scripture, all right, shub for the believer means to turn from unrighteousness towards righteousness, all right? When, when, when you've gone astray and you need to be redirected, you are on a righteous path to begin with, but something pulled you off course and now you need to be redirected. For the non-believer to, to be converted, it means to come from an unrighteous lifestyle to get in the direction of righteousness or living a righteous lifestyle. All right? There's a thing of an unbeliever getting on the right course, and there's the thing of the believer getting back on the right course. All right? So in that what the, what the scripture says here, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Now, out of all of these, like I said, the, 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 the focus point is dealing with verse 7. But we can see how 8 and 9 tie in because, see, when you are converted or when you are repentant in doing what the law of the Lord says because it has changed your way of thinking now what happens is it's getting to the core because it's changing your soul. What is your soul? The Hebrew word is nephesh. All right. 
we can look at it from one aspect of your ability to breathe, but it's about you having the life force that maintains your avatar called a body. So what does that say then? Where am I being divinely perfected other than in my soul? My inner man, as we said previously by kings, is the starting point. But watch this. What I practice begins to now infiltrate who I am and it will go to my core. Are, are, are y'all hearing me? See, see, here's here's the thing that, that a lot of people miss. Can, can, I, can I teach you something? One of the real things about church, one of the real things about being preached to, one of the real things about being taught. Here's, here's the thing that a lot of people miss, okay? What, what happens is people fail to understand as believers that you go listen to the preacher or the teacher to give food to your spirit. Here's the thing, though. Your spirit is meant to be the digestive organ for it to get to your soul. If I don't digest or process what my spirit man is receiving, then it causes my soul to be an anorexia because nothing ever gets to the core. See, some people go through the motions of being spiritual, but yet there's nothing that's changed their soul because they have not let their spirit man digest what they've been fed in order to make their soul become different. Watch this. It's your soul that has the program. It's your soul that has the spiritual DNA. It's your soul that is the database that gets retrieved by the Lord to see if you got it. That's why some people, you can see the difference in what's going on in their life if they're, if they're just being spiritual. Ooh, or are they really being in the spirit all the way to the soul that the soul becomes the witness of the record of what the spirit received? I hope I'm helping somebody today. I've got to get this down into my soul. My spirit gets it, but my soul needs it. Let, let me say that again. My spirit can get it, but my soul needs it. Okay, y'all. Some might have to chew on that one for a moment. They're they, they going to have to hold it for a minute. Ah. Are y'all with me? I ain't lost nobody. Amen. So, it's in my spirit, man, and in my soul, man. My soul. Y'all, watch this, watch this. Can I, can I still carry y'all a little bit deeper on this? Why is it so significant to my soul? <laughs> Other than it's the fact that the Lord want to save your soul, not you. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> the adversary wants your soul. The Lord God wants your soul. So it is significant about the soul. Because watch this. In the reality of the matter... Let's, let's entertain this thing about being emotional. There can be an emotional aspect of a spiritual person, right. but the emotion should be shaped on what's in your soul to drive the spirit of the person in their emotions. If my soul has not gotten divine spirit in it because it's got the laws and so forth, then what happens is my soul has been infected by my flesh. My flesh spirit gets into the emotions of the world that now go to the core of my soul, and it's my soul that now repeats or keeps 
acting out what it has experienced. Y'all think about this. Every time that you've had an encounter that seems to remind you of something that happened in your past that was negative, why is it that you automatically resurrect a certain emotion regarding what someone has done other than the fact that that emotion has now been constructed in your soul? Are y'all with me? Let me let it go. Let me let it go. Hey Amen. Somebody's learning something today, I believe. Can I give you another scripture? Amen. So we can still answer the where. Amen. Let's, let's go New Testament. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. In the book of Galatians... Chapter 3. In Galatians chapter 3. If I may, I, I want to read these first three verses. Amen. Galatians chapter 3. Verses 1 through 3. Now, watch this. It starts off by saying, O foolish Galatians, O godless Galatians, or inhabitants. That's what the word Galatian translates from in the Greek. Who hath bewitched you? Who, who's fascinated you to the point that they've tricked you and manipulated you to believe a lie. That, that's what's being said. That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Okay. Did you, the question becomes, in you receiving the spirit, did you get it by the law or did you get it by faith? Then he says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Uh, are you made perfect by flesh? Okay. So, wait a minute. Let's, let's really look at what's, saying, what's, what's being said here. He says, you've received, and when we say receive, that, that just doesn't mean you took it. To receive means to accept and join with. So he says, you have not only accepted, but you've joined with or come in fellowship with the spirit. Now, this isn't any spirit. If you notice, by the context of the scripture, spirit is capitalized. So we're understanding this as believers to be the Holy Spirit. You've joined with the Holy Spirit because you've accepted it and you come in fellowship with it. All right. Now, due to this, if you started out in the spirit, what has now got you to the place that you are being perfected? Is it by the spirit, the course of the spirit that you've been on, or is it by your flesh, meaning your human nature? <sighs> Y'all. Mm. See, here's the thing. I, I don't want somebody to miss this. 
Because in looking at verse 2, some would say, okay, then it means that by either the law only or by faith, I should be receiving my perfection. All right, but here's the thing. It is by law with faith that I get perfected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, See, some think that the law alone is going to do it. But what we can extrapolate here without faith working the law. It's going to cause me not to see perfection. I, I can, even though, as we have said here previously about having the law in my inner man, having the prescription in my inner man. Here's the thing. I've got to believe in the prescription. I've got to believe, or watch this, not only believe, I've got to have passion about it. Because if I'm looking at faith, faith in the Greek is pistis, which means passion and conviction towards one's truth. Believing is having a truth. Faith is passion and conviction about that truth. Well, the truth that I've got is the law of the word of the Lord, which is my prescription. It's my medication that's supposed to be doing a work in me, in my spirit man, so that my soul man gets it all the way to the core. And when I've got it all the way to the core, it's my spirit man, based on my passion and conviction in the Lord God, that now gets me to the place of me being perfect in this place in me. See, I ain't supposed to just have a spirit man that ain't got no emotion. I ain't supposed to just have a spirit man that's a, 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 a oompa loompa that's just sitting still all the time. I ain't supposed to have a spirit man in myself that don't do nothing. I ain't supposed to have a spirit man that's always sitting like Willy Lump Lump and there's nothing that is exciting me or got me passionate about what I've gotten as as a medication that's working and changing who my spirit is as well as who my soul is. Because in the reality of the matter, let, 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 let me say this, and it ain't even uh, uh, in the subject of teaching. Why do we think that there's joy on the inside of us? The joy that's on the inside is something that operates in the soul man and the spirit man. The, the rejoicing is something that operates in the avatar called the body that's on the outside. But the thing is, the body can't have no real rejoicing if there's nothing in the source of the soul or the spirit of them. Are y'all with me? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. And God says, I've got a joy jar. <laughs> Mm. So this is reiterating New Testament wise mm -hmm. that where my perfecting comes is based on what my spirit and my soul look like. Mm -hmm. Y'all got to get this. You got to get this. I'm not going to just find it because I dress good. I'm going to find it based on my inward dressing. I've said this before to people, and I know everybody doesn't subscribe to it, but when we talk about vestments, it's about inward vesting. There's an investment, first of all, that goes on for the inside based on how you dress yourself and how you feel about yourself. Ah. My spirit man becomes the dressing, but my soul is how I feel about my spirit man. 
If my soul has not got it together to feel good about my spirit, then my spirit man only animates a body that doesn't feel good about itself. Let me give you something else, amen. I know time is getting away from us. We're still here in the New Testament. I want to give you two more verses, or should I say two more passages quickly this afternoon. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3. Verse 14. Amen. Colossians 3.14 says, And above all, meaning greater than anything else, these things put on charity. Now, for those who haven't been on the sound of my voice in teaching, the word put on is the Greek word duo, which means to slide into, not have resistance, and to fit, perfectly fit, or to accurately fit. The word says put on charity. And charity is the word agape that's being used here. Which is the bond of perfectness. Now, what's the punchline? Love or charity is where perfecting should also be working in me. All right? But here, here's the thing. Charity or love does not come by osmosis. It's something that you have to willingly put yourself into. Yes, sir. And when I say this, watch this. You can't always live a life of the school of hard knocks. Because when we talk about charity or love, it means affection. All right. Now, hear me. Hear me and grab this closely. Because as I tell many individuals, agape is about affection. But I like reminding people that agape is the root word of agapeo. What is the difference in agape and agapeo is the fact that agapeo speaks towards hospitality. It speaks towards people feeling welcome based on the affection that you display or put out. So that says, if I am maturing, if I'm being completed in the Lord God, where I can see signs of divine perfection working is how welcome I make other people feel based on me having affection towards other people. See, I can't be racist. I can't have egos. Uh, I, I, I can't have arrogance. I can't have all of the negative factors working in my life to cause my love to be a lie. If I am going to say that I love others, I have to check myself because, watch this, notice that it says above all because real love is one of the hardest things for some of us to get to. Watch, watch this, some people think you start in love, but the thing is you end in love. There's a process that goes on. Even in the perfecting of us as individuals, it's a process for us to get to true love in God. You don't start with it, you end with it. And, and, and I don't mean that you end or, or no longer exist. I mean it becomes the conclusion of the matter of the finale of what you arrive to in wholeness. It's just a thing in the process of living the life that you're living that you can say, hey, I can see my love is changing. Yeah. 
I see my love is getting better. I see that some things that I used to have pride in the sense of arrogance against, I no longer am prideful. I can see some things where where uh, uh, I was racist on some things. Uh, now I'm not racist anymore. I can see some things where I was chauvinistic that now I am no longer chauvinistic. Now I can see what is happening in me for the reality of divine love, agape, happening, and in the same turn, all of those peoples that I had the blockades against, now they want to be in my presence versus rebuking me and not wanting to be around me. Am I helping somebody? Praise the Lord. Let me give you one more. One more scripture to bring this subject to closure. If you'll kindly turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, this kind of bags up what I just gave you in Colossians 3.14. What it says is, herein is our love, once again, the word agape, mm -hmm. made perfect, mm -hmm. that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Now listen, it says, herein, within me, what's now been made in me is love. Agape, that now has come to the place of being perfect. It's teleo. It is complete. It is now my finishing point. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. What are we saying about boldness? Uh, we have the ability to be outspoken. Meaning, I have no shame in the game of what I'm saying because I live what I say. Uh, are are, are y'all understanding? I, I haven't lost anybody. My life matches what's coming out of my mouth because it is my lifestyle. What has happened is there's been much transformation that has occurred in my life. And based on the transformation, now I can boldly speak about it because it's real for me. I experienced this, not just something that somebody taught me and I got instructions, but now I put it to the test and I have experienced it as part of my lifestyle. So I've got no shame. It's just like being a witness. When, 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 I, when I am a witness and I give a testimony, I am supposed to give my testimony in boldness because I'm saying without a shadow of a doubt, I'm not one that's about to give you a lie. I'm fixing to give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. So in that it says boldness in the day of judgment, boldness in the time of separation, because as he is, so are we in this world. Ah, ah, watch this. He says, if this love has been perfected in me, then I represent him in the world. That's, that's, that's what the end part of this verse is. It says, because as he is, based on the subject, which is me having love perfected in me, so are we in this world. Meaning, as I said earlier today, for those that were with me in the message, I said there's two words for world that are significant in the New Testament, cosmos and anos. The word cosmos is being used here, which drills down to meaning the sons of Adam. He says, so if godly love has been perfected or completed or finished in me, I become him in the earth in this vessel, this body, this avatar, 
It's not limiting me by my flesh because it's being dictated to take commands from my soul and spirit, which have now come into the correct form of love that's according to the character or the personality of the Lord God. Verse 18 says, there is no fear in love. Uh, watch this. Basically what it says is if love is perfected in me, if it's matured in me, then it eradicates phobos. It eradicates fear because fear is not in the equation of godly love. Fear is not in the equation, watch this, of me being scared of folks or folks being scared of me because I still have arrogance going on in me. I still got racism going on in me. I still got bigotry going on in me. I, I still got all those negative things. Because see, what happens is all of those things still being mixed in with my love become the fear factor that make my love unreal. But if I want to have real love in the Lord God, those things are being removed so that now I am finished or a completed work because the Lord has no fear of nothing that has been created. It's the fact that we as a creation fear what's been created in us. So this is uh, for us to understand the removal of those things. And when I can look at the trajectory that none of those negative attributes of my human nature is working with my relationship with others. None of the attributes negative of my human nature is working against me in who I'm becoming in Kim. When I can say none of those things have a foothold in my life that they're shaping me and causing me to be, as David said, shaping in iniquity, now I can see where in my my life perfection is now arriving itself. He says, but perfect love, as I said, casteth out all fear. Perfect love casteth out, meaning it throws out, it evicts, it has no room for fear because fear have torment. See, watch this. As long as you're struggling with loving somebody. Now listen, listen, listen. I didn't say you got to like everybody. But I am saying if you're struggling with loving. Okay. Okay. Watch this. I don't want to let nobody go without saying this. Even the old folks used to say there's such thing as tough love. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, okay. Yes. Some that's with me, y'all y'all know. Mm -hmm. Ma used to say, feed them out of a long handled spoon. Oh, that's it. That's uh, oh, okay, y'all. Okay. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. We're feeding them, but there's, there's a distance. Yeah. Okay, so, so in this, it says love hath torment. So if I'm struggling, while I'm in this place of struggling with my love, with my affection, with my hospitality, then that tells me that somewhere, key word, in my life, that perfection needs to work. The rest of the verse says, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. Goes right back to what I was just saying here. Long as I'm struggling with some negative emotions, watch this. As long as my human nature or my flesh is programmed into my soul, it's bypassing my spirit. And my spirit has 
issues with its digestive system. My spirit man is going to continue to have a struggle with getting the appropriate nutrients to my soul. Because what has put stress on my spiritual digestive system, as long as negative, watch this, everything negative that goes on in your life, even in the natural, has an impact on your health. It'll cause you to have high blood pressure, throw your cholesterol off, heart issues, can cause you to have strokes, Migraine. Head, li, 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 listen to this. Listen to what I'm saying. So, so, so in this, what, what we, what we can pull from this is that through the character of the Lord God working in us, now what happens is His love we can identify as to where our issue of perfection is. See, if anybody has gotten anything out of all of these series of, of teachings that I've given on this subject of being perfect, the thing is it comes down to this one subject. What does your soul and your spirit look like? What does your heart look like? What does your inner man look like? All of the change starts with the inner man versus the outer man. It's nothing that, that we can do fabulous to show the church, show the community that makes us on the course of perfection. It's what is going on on the inside of us that really is the source of it all. Amen? So with that, I, 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 I concluded there. These are the verses that I wanted to address and bring to your attention on today. I pray that they've blessed you to put you in a mighty place of understanding regarding this subject about being perfect, i.e. divinely perfect in the Lord. Amen, amen, and amen.